Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Paul Barron. In the world of commercial trumpet playing, Paul is definitely an A-lister. Paul has built a highly successful career as the go-to lead trumpet for the national touring shows of some of Broadway's top hits. Paul has also authored two books that showcase his unique approach to creating consistency, as well as his new book on Broadway trumpet excerpts. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! Welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang, and I am joined by a, a very, very impressive young man. I'll say young. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Paul Checks Barron. Checks in the mail. <laughs> All right. Thanks, buddy. Paul Barron. Paul, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Jose. Oh, man. It is absolutely my pleasure. Um, you know, you have got such an impressive resume and uh, we're going to talk about all the the stuff that, that you've been doing both as a performer and an educator and a, an author and all that good stuff um but um uh, i want to start with with something that's just kind of you know out of left field but i think it's very important um i didn't realize that you were a martial arts practitioner i am although not as much as i would like to be uh these days you know mostly being on the road for the last uh, 18 years or so. Um, it was kind of tough to find dojos to practice uh, and train, you know, in, in, uh, in, in uh, Aikido, which is mostly what I, I really enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I always get worried about, you know, the hands and the chops and, uh, yeah. you know, to, having to show up and, and try and play a show that night with uh, like <laughs> busted up ribs, which I, I I had done early on in my training. Yeah, yeah. So how long did you how long have you been studying? Well, all totaled um oh boy, I probably started in the early 80s. Oh, okay. Um yeah. So it's uh, it's been ongoing and I, I still practice qigong on my own. Oh. Uh and, and mostly for meditation, but mm -hmm. also for the exercise and and just to to keep limber. I, I had a really bad car accident about 10 and a half years ago, uh, mm -hmm. nearly fatal. And uh as a result, with eight herniated discs and st being on the road, sleeping in hotel, different hotel beds mm -hmm. uh every week, you know, it kind of takes a whole a toll on the body. Right. Uh, as it would normally, but in particular after the accident. So the Qigong just helps keep things open and, and flowing and yeah. Cool. cool. Yeah. Well, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, that Qigong is actually one of my specialties. So, uh, you know, I, I taught martial arts for uh, 30 years uh, before kind of hanging up the belt uh, to focus on some other stuff, but what kind and of what was your main practice? Uh, I, I uh, specialized in in a variety of Chinese systems. My my main like the thing that I was best known for is like Tai Chi and uh -huh. uh, and Qigong. So uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's been a big part of my life and a big part of um, my approach to everything. So uh, we'll, we'll have to have a deeper conversation about Qigong. We don't want to bore these trumpet players, even though every trumpet player should probably practice some type of Qigong. I think that's, that is so critical. Absolutely. And, you know, I, as you said, we should probably get a deeper conversation at some point, and we don't have to get into it now. But I can attest, I think at least, um, Aikido has saved me um, twice from really bad car accidents where I just – um, you know, the practice of Rod Dory, where you've got three people coming at right. you, attacking you from all different angles. And I swear to God, um, having had that experience and just being aware of not only what's in front of me, but side and behind me mm -hmm. um, from that practice, I think that saved me in a couple of really bad car accidents where I just go, OK, I know what's going on here. I'm just going to let things go past me. And and sure enough there was a major pileup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's the thing is that uh, the practices 
if you uh, particularly uh, systems like Aikido, uh, Taiji, things like that, um, they're the skills that you learn are more than just you know how to how to break somebody's elbow. Yeah, you know, the, the the especially the those arts where sensitivity is such a critical component to what you're doing. So it's the the situational awareness, the sensitivity, the ability to uh, deal with with uh, situations in a way that allows you to flow with them as opposed to trying to just bore your way through things. And uh, I know my training has helped me countless times, even just the other day when I you know, was walking out on a stepped on an icy patch and uh, instead of, you know, flipping up, uh, you know, I'm able to just relax and kind of sink and, and just slide on the ice as opposed to falling on the ice. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, those those skills are critical. And, and I think more important is the mental component. Um, and for me, it's the, you know, in, in Chinese, they use the term Kung Fu, uh, which, you know, people say Kung Fu, which actually just, it doesn't mean martial arts. It means a skill that you get through time and hard work. And that I think is critical, whether it's in martial arts or in music or in any other thing. The only way you're going to get real mastery, the only way you're going to get it so that it happens without you having to think about it or without you having to try to do it is to put in the time, you know, but you also have to put in the effort. You can't practice 30 years and do it half-assed and expect to, to be good at it. And you can't practice 100% for a year and expect to be good at it. It's that balance of the two. And I see Absolutely. that I see that as being a critical component in trumpet playing as well, that, uh, you know, you got to put in the time, you got to put in the energy. And I think also that ability to not bull your way through. So how, how have you been able to apply some of those uh, Aikido principles uh, to your trumpet playing? Boy, this is a really interesting conversation. I'm loving it. Um, you know, uh, blending with the trumpet and not fighting it, you know, is kind of a way. Um, that was one of the things that I loved about uh, when I first started studying Aikido is that you're not doing this, you know, um, in some of the other martial arts forms, it's the biggest and the strongest and the fastest and whoever hits first or kicks first or whatever, you know, uh, wins the, the, uh, the fight. But with Aikido, as you know, um, you know, it's blending with your opponent or the person you're training with um, and, and flowing, you know, with that energy and, and getting them in a position where they're not going to do you harm, you're not going to do them harm, and there's going to be no retaliation. Well, I, I feel the same way with the trumpet. If I hit it too hard and I go, okay, I'm going to beat you into submission, um, the horn is going to turn around and beat me into submission and it's probably going to win. Yeah. Um, so if I just listen to my body, the energy uh, flow and, uh, and my chops and, and, you know, if things are not going well this way, you know, you, you, you meet a, a, a brook wall um, in, in some martial arts forms, it's, you know, beat through that, uh, that brick wall uh, to get to, you know, the other side. Whereas with Aikido, it might, be well i could go over it i could go around it i could uh i could need not even worry about it yeah. <laughs> you know so i think that's really helped me in many ways to not just bully the the trumpet and and trying to to blend with it and and also listen to what my body is telling me yeah you know that's that's been a recurring theme with so many uh people particularly lead players that that i've talked to it's the you know hey when i was 18 19 20 uh, I could just bull my way through a gig. Uh, but you know, when you, when you've been playing for 30, 40 years and you, your body gets a little older and, and let's face it, unfortunately our bodies do start to decline in, in terms, mostly in terms of our, uh, recuperative factors. Yeah. So, uh, whether, you know, and, and a physical activity, yeah, that's why you don't see, you don't see professional football players play much after 40 at a yeah. high level, you know, cause the body just can't take the beating. It can't come back, but trumpet players, you know, we're, we're doing that. And especially if you're playing professionally and you're, 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 you're working hard, you're beating your lips up every night. And that's a lot of damage that uh, your, your system just eventually it's harder for it to keep up with, with the demands. So the ability to play smarter and not harder uh, has has been a theme for all of the guys that I know 
that are still, you know, as they get into their 50s and their 60s and, you know, 70s even, that are able to still play at a high level of skill uh, because their ability to adjust that, that mental concept of playing. So, I mean, have you, have you noticed that in your own career, how you've had to make these kind of shifts in how you approach your playing as, as you've gotten older and, and have more demands on you? Well, um, you're absolutely right. You know, when we were in our 20s, uh, you know, the resiliency of youth was uh, was definitely on our side. And, and uh, you know, there were times where, <clears throat> well, I'd, oftentimes I had three, four, five nights a week of uh, Latin gigs and getting home at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, uh, get a few hours sleep back up again and into the studio at about nine in the morning for a, a jingle or uh, film date or whatever it may be. And um, boy, I didn't really have to worry about warming up. Part, partially, I guess it was that I was warm for the night before, but also um, I hadn't been uh, laying down too much and and the, the swelling, you know, setting in, but also uh, just being, you know, in my early twenties and resilient um, sure, sure carried me through a lot of things that uh, that, that my intellect and my intelligence wasn't carrying me through. So um, there was that. And uh, just fast forward to about 40 years old. Um, at the time when I turned 40, I recall I was uh, on Full Monty um, musical. I was touring that for a couple of years. And I just realized, you know, I'm 40 years old. I really better start figuring things out to be more efficient. And um Funny thing is, I, I did some uh, some adjustments in my equipment. Um, I, I had always been told, you know, go bigger, bigger, bigger. If you want a big sound, you know, so and so uh, Byron Stripling can play lead on a one and a half C Bach mouthpiece. So uh, therefore, it can be done. So I should do it right. And uh, right. for years, I I tried to do that on a three C with a big, huge throat and back bore, and. Uh, I mean, I, I did it, but boy, I was working really hard. So when I got to be 40, I, I just realized I should, I should start playing more efficient equipment as well. So I went from big, huge tubby mouthpieces to much uh, more efficient mouthpieces, um, which is not extreme. What I play is, is uh, for many lead players standards, it's, it's not that, that deep or narrow or, or uh, tight of, of a backboard or anything, but it's much smaller than a, what it was for me. Also, yeah. I realized that I had to adjust my um, my idea about warm ups and what those were actually for. You know, like now I am a firm believer of wiping the slate clean or doing uh, damage control. I think Wayne Bergeron calls it. Uh, where the next day, you know, you have to erase the damages or or um, uh, whatever abuse that we put ourselves through the previous day and start fresh. And I've realized how to do that finally um, by listening to the signs that my body has given me um, and also learning where my governor is on a, on a gig. I, I don't push it as far as I used to when I was in my 20s. I could just beat the hell out of it and you know, go pedal to the metal, 100% exertion and bounce back the next day and feel okay. Or so I thought. Um, and now I've realized that it's much smarter and more efficient and I can bounce back the next day and still do the gig if I'm only pushing about 85%, just mm -hmm. keeping a little bit in the reserve tank so that I know the next day when I get up, I can do that damage control and know that I can, I can pull off the gig that night. And yeah. I've been really fortunate, knock on wood, until COVID hit. Um, the last tour I was doing of Aladdin, I was nonstop 52 weeks a year, eight shows a week with rehearsals and sound checks every city. Um, and I was I feeling pretty good about maintenance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not to say that I didn't have some days, shows, even weeks that were more of a struggle than other weeks, um, but I could still get through it. And hopefully the audience and the conductor and anybody writing my check and <laughs> signing my check wasn't aware of. <laughs> right, 
Right. Well, yeah, and that's a big thing. Uh, you know, that when you're talking about doing, you know, 52 weeks a year, and that that's that's insane. And I want to dive into that a little bit deeper here in a minute. But you know, one of the things that I've always heard in regards to your your playing was that you know you're a lot of people say yeah he's a machine that you know you're just you're so consistent in your performances and and uh, yeah I know that that you you do have those times when you're going to pick the horn up and it's going to feel like everything is effortless and then you're the next day it may feel like everything is an effort but you still have to make those days sound as good as the day before so when you're when you're in a situation like when you're when you're doing those kind of gigs where where there's that consistency that's needed because it's a consistent show, um, you know, obviously the warm up helps you, but but are there other concepts that you have to to pull into play in terms of uh, how you can maintain consistency from show to show, uh, arena to arena, uh, you know, performance stage to performance stage. Uh, you know, so that that it doesn't sound like it's a different trumpet player every night. Great question. Um, yes, the consistency. Uh, I I think that comes from. Uh, well, part of it comes from work ethic. Um, I make sure that I get a warm up in, and you know, we don't have to go into my whole warm up. And I actually have three different ones, um, and and wrote a book based on those those three warm ups, but they all have one underlying thing, which is listen to the body, listen to the signals, the, the messages that uh, my chops and the rest of my body are sending me. So um, as far as the work ethic, I make sure that I get in a good warm up um, earlier in the day, uh, mid morning or so seems to work well for my body and my schedule and so on. Uh, and sometimes it takes five to 10 minutes. And I feel like all the lights are on and, and everything's working and I could go and play a show right away. There are other times where it may take me an hour to an hour and a half of really slow, meticulous, uh, work. And, and sometimes it's, it's a matter of just being on the lead pipe for 10 minutes, trying to get my air and my sound happening. So I think the consistency just comes from, um, from making sure that I'm doing the correct things that my body needs for that day. Um, and it's not always the same from one day to the next. Also, you were talking about different venues, you know, a, a stadium one time might be a smaller theater, you know, mine are all soft seater theaters cause I'm doing Broadway shows. So I'm not doing big uh, arena shows um, anymore. I had done those, but so by and large, it's the difference between, let's say, a 1,500-seat uh, theater and a 4,200-seat theater. I think the largest is in uh, Atlanta, the Fox Theater in, in Atlanta. And um, so that's a point I, I could share as well with the listeners is that I, I try to maintain at least a consistent uh, approach to the way I play the horn. And, uh, and I don't try anymore when I was in my twenties and thirties, I tried to fill up a room, whatever room that may be with my sound. Now I don't worry about that. There's a microphone in front of my bell and what I need to do from my position of being a trouble player is make sure that I'm getting the correct notes and the correct time in the, the right intonation and the right style and, inflections and, and uh, you know, phrasing and all the rest of that stuff. If I can get it out the horn with the right intensity of sound and so on, um, I just have to surrender it uh, to the sound people and hope that they're going to make sure that people can hear it. And if they don't, well, I've done my job. I, I can't worry about doing theirs. So yeah. that that's a part of it as well. And I found that I was really inconsistent from city to city to city um, when I get into a pit and one is all concrete and it's really live and you go, bop, and it's like, bah! you sound like, you know, like you're yeah. through huge Marshall stack speakers and other places where it's all um, absorbent on the ceiling above you. There's shag carpeting everywhere, you know, and it's just making your sound like that. 
Um, and, and I tried to adjust that. Now I don't adjust that. My, my tongue position, my chops, my angle of horn, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I try to maintain that as consistently as I can. And as I said, then just hope that it's being picked up by the microphone and, and dealt with, you know, out there in the house. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember one of my, uh, one of my trumpet teachers, I was, yeah, I, most of the gigs I do are, are commercial gigs, you know, uh, brick house bands, that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, pl- just playing so loud and so hard because you're trying to hear yourself over, you know, the drummer and the bass and guitar and stuff like that. And, you know, my teacher saying, look, you, you know, you're going to kill yourself. Just, you know, if you're playing on a mic, trust the sound man. You know, just, you know, you play and you play the way you play and it's up to him to make sure that you get heard. So yes. that was kind of a, a revelation to me. Of course, that means you have to have a good sound man. That's why I always bribe it. Listen, bribe your sound man. If you're, if, Absolutely. You know, he's your best friend. So, uh, you know, I, I would just have to really focus on allowing uh, them to do their job. So, you know, just I will do my job, you do your job, and if we both do our jobs right, then it's going to be a good gig. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, that that's a, I think that's such a, a critical thing because uh, you know th- these are all little points that you know, these are the things you don't learn when if you're uh, going to school to get a degree in in trumpet performance. These are the things you're not going to learn. You know, these are the things that that you have to spend time talking to guys like you to to understand and to learn. And I think that's you know been a, a missing component in so much of the educational space is the real world skills. You know, it's 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 great if you can play the horn, but you've got to know how to to manage yourself on a gig. You need to know, uh, you know, beyond the the musical aspects, you have to understand the business aspects as well. So, uh, you know, with all of your years of experience uh, on on the road with uh, Broadway shows, um, I can see, and I'll I'll, I'll backtrack here on a, this for one second. I've played in, in bands before where uh, you know it's been, hey, I'm tired of playing this song. You know, we, we you know I, we play it too much. We play it too much. I don't want. I'm sick of playing it. And I think, you know, my God, you know what would you do if you were touring a Broadway show? What, what if you were, if you were doing a 52 week run of playing the same show every night, how would you manage that? Um, and I think a lot of people don't think about the fact that, you know, gigs like this, that, yeah, you, you're going to, you've got to play the same music every night and you have to do it in a convincing manner. You can't, you can't half ass it. So what is your secret to maintaining that level of excitement, the intensity, the the love for what you're doing, even though you're basically doing the same show every night. You know, th- there are, we're all hardwired differently, of course, you know, and there are some people that enjoy um, having a, a, the, the steady uh, gig to do. And, and some people need to be creative all the time. Um, I guess I'm not a terribly creative person, but um, I, I do think that my martial arts training has helped me um, to Zanshin. I'm sure you know that that yeah. that term um, for those out there. Um, and, and Jose, correct me if I'm getting um, getting this wrong, but um, if I'm remembering correctly, Zanshin is the staying in the moment and and aware of everything in the present time and not worrying about the past, not worrying about what's coming up in the future, just staying focused and in the moment. And I, I really practice that when I'm in a pit, if I'm in uh, a show, for instance, like carousel, where there's hardly any playing for the trumpets and it's boring as hell and not one of my favorite shows at all to play, that's a great opportunity. You see, you can you can either take the negative, like, oh God, I hate this show. I can't wait till it, it's over. Or you can take the positive in that, all right, there's lots of time where I can meditate in the pit. You know, you don't have to close your eyes and and chant and and all that kind of stuff and burn incense, but you can still get get focused and and uh and and meditate. And so I use that opportunity to do exactly that. Um there's a few other things that I, I factor in as far as playing a consistent show. 
Um, I believe the people in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and Costa Mesa, California and everybody in between deserves the same quality of show. And they're paying to see the show possibly for their very first time. And they're excited and they want to see this performance that they've been looking forward to for months since they bought that ticket. And it's up to, to me and everybody else around me, but I can only, you know, do my own thing. It's up to me to give them the very best show that I have within me. And I, I want to respect them um, because let's face it, the ticket purchasers are the people that are writing my checks and exactly. it's the longevity in this business to keep them happy. So I always feel that they deserve the same on opening night, Tuesday night, or three months later, everybody deserves the same show. So I, I try to approach it with that same kind of respect. And um, I'll just interject this as well. I think that being on the road as many years as I, I have been and uh, beaten myself into <laughs> some some pretty bad corners and and tried to learn and and get out of those corners has been invaluable. Um, it, things like, for instance, oh, just about a year and four months ago, I was in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and I, I was with uh, Aladdin, woke up one morning, and it was like I had a bee sting on the left side of my face. My my I was swollen out like crazy. My whole um, lips were were skewed because it was so fro uh, oh. um, swollen up, and I I was starting to freak out a little bit. And uh, I went over to my wife and like, look at this, and she's go, oh my god, what did you do? And I, all I had done is just woken up and I was gonna brush my teeth, and I'm like, I can't fit it in there because it's so swollen. Mm -hmm. So I spent the next three hours trying to play a second line G and just get that to vibrate. So I I started migrating the horn across my face to a spot where I could get a vibration finally. And then I, I warmed up in that spot, put it away with the hope and, and, and pray and whatever else um, that I could make it through the show that night. And so I got to the show and I told the local second and third players, hey guys, this is what happened. They looked at me and went, oh God, <laughs> yikes. Should you even be here? And I said, look, I'm just going to pull back a little bit in volume. I'm going to climb in on the mic a little bit and just hope the hell that something comes out the end of my horn and reaches the mic. So I said, you know, if you need to, to hear me a little bit more, you know, you might need to turn it up in the monitors or something, but, but that's what I got to do to get through the gig. And you know, it's experiences like that that uh, I'm so thankful for that I can I can now share and and hopefully help somebody else through a you know an adverse situation like that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's man, that's a scary one. I know, I've I've had uh, gigs I've had to play after getting uh, dental work done and yeah, you know, having Novocaine and it's yeah, I you know playing oh, wow. having to move things over a little bit. Yeah, nah, no, no fun. It's not no fun. Not not one of the things that you want to intentionally do. <laughs> so no, um, and it's nothing that anybody would ever teach us in a college situation either. Because no offense to you know the majority of the professors there, but uh, I don't know about you, but but mine had only ever played a few professional gigs, went from high school to bachelor degree to master's to doctorate to then teaching us how to play. And, you know, uh, his solution to beat up chops is, well, don't do the gig then. Yeah. OK, so I don't pay my rent then. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> how yeah. is that possible? Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, that's uh, th there are a couple couple really interesting things that, that you kind of brought up there that that I want to kind of circle back on. Um, one is the the idea that, you know, you're you're playing with this touring group with this performance uh, and you have local musicians that are filling out the rest of the orchestra. So uh, that means while you're playing the same show every night, you're basically playing with a different orchestra every night or close to or, or at least for, for, for the run in that city. Um, so when you're, when you're in that situation, 
uh, and you're trying to, you know, be consistent in your performance and you've got all these variables occurring around you, um, I'll make this a two parter. One, does that mess with your Zen you know, when when you when you're having to worry about what's going on with the second and third players being the as being the lead player? Uh, and then uh, two, uh, how do you uh, how do you personally uh, manage being that lead person and uh, establishing with the the newer guys, you know, the foundation of, of what you're going to need to do in that particular gig? Sure. Uh, you may have to remind me of the second part okay. if I get too long winded in the first right, part. No but, problem. Uh, so I should, first of all, start out by saying I love um, traveling and picking up local orchestras because for me, that keeps the gig fresher. I've got new things. As you said, There, uh, I'm in a new city. I've got new players around me. There's different things, new things to listen to all the time. Um, so that 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 keeps me more in the moment and focused because, oh, hey, I never heard that quite that way before, uh, whether it be really good or not so good or somewhere in between, you know, it's always different. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. Now, as far as uh, messing with my Zen um, and my focus, absolutely, it, it can. Um, and and then then it just becomes another opportunity to to get even deeper into it and and really really focus on what I need to do, and uh, sometimes it's it's harder than other times. Uh, you know, I get to a certain city and I don't have to think about anybody else. I can just tell in the first eight measures of rehearsal, everybody's done their homework. Everybody is there to really do a great job and and they sound fantastic. There are other places where maybe the, the pool of local musicians wasn't quite as deep and uh, maybe the, the level of players that they wanted to get were already busy doing something else. So we get the next tier down and, and that's fine. So um, I guess that brings me to the second part. What do I need to do, um, you know, with the local musicians to help them and so on. And, and I, I really feel like the definition of lead you know, lead player um, is is not like some people think, which is play the highest, the loudest, the fastest, and and hang over and and kiss off at the end notes and and so on, and and go the hey dig me, you know. Um, I really feel like it's showing by example, and and so I need to then when I'm in a situation where the local orchestra is maybe not, you know the best in the country. Um, I, I need to just focus on my own thing and be, be really, really consistent and also nurturing, you know, um, let's face it, not everybody can play like Doc Severinsen. Um, but the person sitting next to me is there for a reason. Hopefully they're, they're there because they're totally competent. And uh, if they're, a little bit uh, unsure of their their gig and so on. I want to help um, make them feel a little bit more confident. So I, I try to be nurturing and uh, and you know lots of positive comments like oh yeah that's great and and uh, but I could le use a little bit more you know so on. Um, there are times where I uh, I need to count measures and stuff for the players around me and. Uh, Again, it could be a negative or it could be a positive direction, you know, to take. For me, it's a, I try to take the positive in that, okay, if I know my part well enough, I, I can play that without thinking of it too much and I can still count somebody else's measures and help them come in. So that helps get me even deeper into the music. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I'm not going to get uh, the players next to me to play at the top of their game, if I'm browbeating them or, you know, looking down or talking down to them, th they're there for a good reason. So I, I just want to be as nurturing and positive as I can. Did yeah. that answer both parts yep. of the question? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's actually spot on. And, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so the, the next thing that I wanted to kind of back up onto was, um, when you're talking about your warmups in, in, um, you said that you know, you have a, a few that you, that you utilize and you were talking about consistency. And I think this is, this is a really interesting point that you have 
a consistent approach to warm up, but that consistent approach doesn't mean that you do the same thing all the time, the way you go about it. You're looking for consistency in, in the sound or the feel, and it sounds like you're adjusting what you do to help you to get to establish that base, that, that consistent feeling uh, that you're looking for in your playing. Um, so, you, and you had mentioned that you had written a book uh, that, that coincides with that. So uh, is, is that uh, the, your first book, the, the Trumpet Voluntarily uh, book? That It's actually my second one. And the reason I wrote the second one, um, it, it's almost a, like a supplementary uh, book, but, but not really. Um, in my first book, Trumpet Voluntarily, um, I talked about the need f- to warm up and, and be consistent in the feel, as you said, and the sound that I'm after. Um, and then like water, you know, I, I just like to, to let the, uh, the warm up flow, but there are some consistent things that I, I always do. I mean, I'm always playing some long tones and I'm, I'm doing some flexibility and some, um, you know, some flow studies and so on. Um, that is consistent from all three warmups, but uh, um, the reason I wrote the second book is because I got all these wonderful comments from l- quite literally around the world, and and I I don't mean to sound boastful, but it, it was more just I I didn't know what I was doing when I wrote the first book, and then I'm hearing from people from New Zealand and and Tokyo and London and and uh, Frankfurt and so on going wow, this is a really great book. I'm thank you. But, you know, you talk about your warm up a little bit through that first book. Can you send me, you know, all three of your warm ups and uh, in a PDF or something? And I talked to my publisher and he goes, well, let's just do another book. And so, so I did. And, and that's kind of been a big hit as well. So I'll just if you don't mind, very briefly, I'll just tell you the, the what the three warmups are and why they are. I won't go into. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We don't need to go into the contents of it. But um, so uh, the first one, and I'm not sure what order I put them in the book, and it doesn't actually matter at all. Um, there's one called the morning after a warm up, and it has nothing to do with uh, partying and staying out way too late, late uh, at night. I was going to show my age and say it was Maureen McGovern, you know, the theme from uh, Poseidon Adventure. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, but but what this is, is, is uh, you know, clearing the dust away, the, the doing the damage control and so on, and trying to get a, a focus back and undo um, any of the stresses and damages and so on that we did uh, the previous day. So that's that's what that's about. And the morning after, um, as the title suggests, I do that in the morning. And I'll, I'll do that like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, um, especially on a, on a show day or a, a gig day where I know that I, I'm going to have to you know, play that night. It's not a very strenuous warm-up. It's just to get things going and, um, and, and, Part of it is also for my confidence to know that, okay, so I, I've I've taken care of business. I, I've uh, I've got my vibration happening, and also doing it that time of day, it gets more blood flowing and stuff into the chops, washes away the lactic acid, and uh, helps the reju- rejuvenation through the rest of the day, so that when I show up to the show, um, I've got some confidence and also some chops <laughs> to do the show. Right. Um, the second warm up, I guess, if if that's the the, the order that I wrote it in, um, it, I just call it gig day warm up, and it it really doesn't have to be um, saved for a day when you only have a gig. Um, what that warm up for me presumes is that I don't have to do a lot of damage control. Um, I, I I'm I get up and I, you know, I do my first lead pipe thing and. And I go, okay, yeah, it feels fine. I don't have to do the morning after. I don't have to do as much damage control. I can get into this other thing. Um, it's also longer and a little more strenuous where it goes from warm up into uh, an actual routine. Um, and that brings me to a little sidebar point, which is I think that a lot of people are unaware of when the warm up ends and practicing begins. And I think it's really important to 
to realize and discover in ourselves when we're warmed up and when we're ready to actually, you know, hit the stage and, and start firing on all, all cylinders and not use that up. Um, so that segues into my third warm up, which is pre show warm up. And this all comes from uh, when I, I did some adjudicating uh, through the years at high school and college level uh, big band competitions and so on, jazz festivals. And uh, oftentimes a as a, an adjudicator and a, a judge, um, you know, you'd be watching the, the, uh, the band play, writing your notes and talking into the, the tape and, you know, so on. And then I'd get my little 15 minute um, little mini masterclass with that band. So we'd get off or they'd get off stage and go to another, you know, practice hall or something. And then I get my little 15 minutes with them. Well, as I'm wandering up and down those practice room hallways, I would hear these bands warming up and these trumpet players, these young guys, man, they're just wailing double G's all over the place. And, and just, I, you know, and I'm, and I'm getting excited. Wow. Who's that band behind that door? I can't wait to hear them hit the stage. And then they do. And the poor guy's got nothing left because they left it all in the practice room. Yeah. So that brought about the, uh, the pre-show warm up. So that, for me, presumes that I've done either the morning after or the gig day warm up. So I've, I've already got things going um, earlier in the day. My pre show is simply get it up there, you know, get it, get things vibrating again. I'll do a few scale things, get up a little higher. I'll do some um, very gentle, everything is about a mezzo forte level. I don't have to play double forte because I know that. When I have to do that, all it is is just step on the gas and open up a little bit more and let it happen rather than abuse myself during warm up. I know it's going to be there. And part of that is the confidence of having done warm ups earlier in the day. So, really, my pre show warm up is no more than three to five minutes. And, and that's plenty. Then I, I, I have the confidence I can set the horn down and know that when the conductor gets up there and there's the downbeat, I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and that, that book is available, uh, available on Q press. Q press. Yeah. And, and actually, uh, let me see. It's, uh, it's back there. Yeah, I see. I, you, Here, I, both of your books, one and two. I, I, I did imagine that. I, <laughs> yeah, actually, I have three books, but I don't have my first one. So th this is the the warm up book that we were just talking about. So so this picture, I I love it. Um, not because it's of me, but because it's a, a funny caricature. And uh, a, one of our props people on Aladdin and I, we, we sat down and we had lunch one day. And um, she's a wonderful artist and would do all the wall tags. You know, you, you go mm -hmm. to all these theaters and you see. Um, art from each of the shows. And, and she was uh, the one that mostly did that. So I said, you know, I've, I've got this book coming up and I've got this idea. Um, it's a warm up book. And I thought, well, not only am I, you know, warming up my chops, but the horn as well. It, it's kind of like sticks, you know, like your s'mores or something right. Right. <laughs> over, over, over a little campfire. So um, this came from a conversation over lunch. That's and I great. said, you know, uh, she had some trees up in here um, as well. And I said, you know, I, I like the idea of a woodshed. And and people of our uh, age group would would know what that term means. That's right. Maybe some younger kids, not so much. But I just thought I'm, I'm going to put it there just for my own sake and anybody else that might appreciate that. Anyway, mm -hmm. that was just a, a short little conversation. Oh, that's awesome. That is so funny. Uh, yeah. yeah. But you know, that, that, uh, that idea that, you know, you're taking, because I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago myself and it's, it's kind of the same thing where you, you know, you have these, these things that you, you do that you teach and you go, well, I should maybe write a book about that. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in a process now of writing my second one because exactly the same thing. It's like, Oh, I really like this, but you know, can you help me with, with this aspect and can we dive a little bit deeper? And so I'm like, okay, well, there's book number two and three and four. Yeah. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. And, and I think honestly, I think things like writing a book, um, 
are great tools, not that you necessarily have to publish them, but to take your ideas, to take your your practices and your protocols and put them on paper and you know, look at them because it, it then it goes from being something that you, you hear and you, you know, you think about in your head or you, you know, you, you're feeling as you're playing, but when you start to put it on paper, it makes it in some ways even more concrete and it, it gives it a different layer of substance. And then uh, sometimes, you know, it helps you to uh, be clearer on what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. So it, it helps you as much as it does the the person who's reading it. So, um, it it sure does. I, I I learned so much on all all three books. My my third one. I I guess I shouldn't be plugging too much, but hey, yeah, 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 plug plug away because we're going to have links in the show notes, folks. Oh, you are. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, here's the third one. It just came out in December. The Broadway Trumpeter, and uh, you know, you were Jose. You were talking about. Um, how people ask you how to do a certain thing, or, you know, you want to dig deeper into it. This is about 30 years in the making. Not that I've been spending 30 years writing this silly thing, but um, for at least 30 years, I I thought, you know, why don't we have a book with Broadway excerpts? You know, um, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, growing up, uh, going through college and all that kind of stuff, we had stacks probably of classical literature, Right. all the excerpts and and in fact many auditions are are uh held using those uh excerpts and one playing those excerpts um and when i first started getting called to do shows you know at 18 years old uh it scared the hell out of me and um especially if there wasn't much notice it was uh you know at 18 i wasn't the first call i was I was being called to, to sub for some guy who got a much better paying gig. So I, I'd, I'd come in and I'm just like sweating bullets, you know, cause I, I had never played the show. I hadn't played any shows really by that point. And uh, there was no resource there, you know, um, that was before YouTube and internet and all the rest of that stuff. So, um, so I thought, well, I should really, there, there should be a book out yeah. there for that. And, and there wasn't. And then in the last, you know, 20 years of touring and I'm talking with all these players all across the country and they're going, yeah, I, I always thought that it'd be great if there was this book of Broadway excerpts and so on. And, and I, yeah, man, I've been talking about that for 30 years. And, and finally, and only because I had two previous books with Q press, I talked to that publisher and I said, uh, I got this idea. What do you think? Um, and then I thought, but, the uh the licensing you know the, so many of those composers are, are still alive right you know how how could i possibly do that without it being way too cost prohibitive and um so they found out what needed to be done um certain things did change in the book not a lot but what was added to it to make it um educational was they asked me to put a little blurb in front of uh preceding every musical um, just an anecdote um, or or uh, playing tips or practicing tips or or so on. So like, oh, I don't know, into the woods, you know, I suggest, okay, well, this is probably better suited for a trumpet player who's got a fair amount of classical training, um, but can also, you know, play some shows and, and so on. Whereas in the Heights, you know, you got to have somebody that really knows Latin music and how to get that fiery salsa, you know, Raul Agraz kind of uh, vibe to it. Um, so, you know, I, I make those suggestions or other anecdotes, like, for instance, um, mounting the tour of the show Memphis in the city of Memphis um, was so much fun. The, the city just, they all came out and, and every shop and restaurant and, and so on had signs in their windows and, uh, and, and, you know, 20% discount for dinner. If you come here, if you're with the show and so uh, on. Yeah. So, you know, little, little stories like that um, or uh, stories like, yeah, playing Andrew Lloyd Webber shows like Avita. I say, yeah, I did that for, toured that for 14 months, which was 24 months too long, you know, things, <laughs> things like that. So th that's all right. in the book. And it amounted to, uh, it's hard to tell here, but 
349 pages. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of a monster. It took on uh, a life of its own and we're already in the works of uh, volume two for all the other shows that I didn't include. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, I would strongly suggest if you're interested in uh, either honing your, your show chops or just to learn a little bit more about it, check out that book for sure. And also those warm up books, because I, I know I'm going to be adding those to my library as well, because uh, I mean, I love Broadway. Uh, I, I, you know, I, when I was, a, when I was a younger player, uh, you know, high school, college, uh, you know, there, there were only three ways that, that I was working. It was, it was either, you know, uh, playing with a, a, uh, a big band, you know, dance band, yeah. um, playing, uh, with a, like a funk band or playing a musical, you know, uh, whether it be, uh, being called in to do a, a high school or a, a college or a community show. But, you know, I used to love getting those calls to play shows. I just, I just love the music, especially the older shows. I mean, I think still to this day, one of my favorite shows, uh, to not only play, but just, just to, to watch is guys and dolls. I just, oh, yeah. I just love that show. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, the, but like you said, there, there's not, unless you were in that, in that environment, um, there just, there wasn't anything to do. There's no way to learn about it. And, uh, you know, now you, you do have the advantage of being able to get a book like that and to, uh, find, uh, the soundtrack on any of your favorite streaming services and, and, yeah. uh, and, and get the vibe. But, uh, there's, there's so much going on. Uh, I think that's why I, I love, uh, the, I, the concepts that they go on with being a, a, a player like you that's doing these Broadway kind of shows is that the music covers such a wide spectrum. Uh, you know, you, you've, you've got, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful lyrical orchestral playing that you have to do on one show and another show. Like you said, you, you've, you've got to be able to, to burn the house down. So uh, it's it's really challenging, and so I really want to thank you for for taking the time and and putting it out for for all of us trumpet players to to torture us and uh, make us hate ourselves even more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. You know, um, it's it's interesting. Um, through the years, I've had lots of um, local players sit down next to me that. Um, well, I mean, a lot of really positive, great players and uh, and a few that have approached it um, that the musical was beneath them. You know, they, they were a, a principal player in a symphony, um, even if it was a small town symphony. In fact, the uh, the really major symphony guys are the coolest, you know, but it's the ones that are in these little teeny regional theaters. I, I've had some, uh, I guess I could say run ins because it, they weren't terribly positive, where they come in and they look down on the musical like, oh, well, this isn't, you know, uh, like, you know, us as, as commercial players, we call classical music, um, and, and this is not a slight, but we call it legit, you know, yeah. legit player or legit music, whatever. Well, um, coming from the other side, I guess, you know, these certain couple of people were thinking Broadway music was illegitimate, I suppose. And, you know, there's, a, as you said, there's so many different styles. I can, I, I, the one example I'd love to give in masterclass is um, Monty Python's Spamalot. And I, I toured that for just over, well, about two and a half years. And it started with classical. Then there was some swing. There was a polka. There was disco. There was klezmer. Um, you know, there's 80s power ballad uh you name it, it's right, probably right. in there. So um, to say something like that is illegitimate um, or to look down on it when you have to be able to wear that many different hats, you know, as a orchestra player, they, they might come back and say, oh, yeah, but you don't play Stravinsky the same as you would play Brahms or Mozart. Well, that's very true, but it's all within the sort of classical music, uh, you know, um, genre, um, as opposed to the musical theater where you're bouncing all over the map, you know, yeah. um, you never know what's going to happen. So, um, thankfully I am seeing more of those legit players starting to come around and realize that, wow, this isn't as easy as they thought, you know, it's not, it, it, it demands a certain amount of respect as much as Brahms or Beethoven or anything else does. 
Yeah. Well, you know, and that's that's kind of the interesting thing um, that, you know, whether whether you go back to to Beethoven or Mozart um, or you go to uh, Ellington and Strayhorn or you come to the modern day, um, you know, that music was the popular music of the time. And at that time, it was by the establishment looked down on. Yeah, you know, because this isn't what we grew up on. This isn't what we consider to be the epitome of this art form, and uh, it's it, the the value of it is generally not really known until some time passes. You know, the the things that are flash in the pan will will disappear, and the things that that are are worth staying around will stay around. So you know, certainly you know Mozart, Stravinsky, you know. Yes, you know, it's still still here, but you know, so is Irving Berlin. So, and and there's a reason because if you look at some of you know, uh, you know, my heart definitely lies in the in the older musicals, but you know, sure. the, the the newer ones, absolutely. I mean, I love the music in Aladdin. I I think it's just it's phenomenal. Um, you know, Into the Woods. You know, they're just. I mean, the 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 really good musicals are good musicals because the music is good. Yeah. And, you know, when you listen to it, you know, there there are beautiful melodies. There's uh, beautiful orchestrations. Uh, there there's all of the things that make something musical. There's so, always something that makes it artistic. And, you know, yeah, sometimes the lyrics can might be a little cheesy. I don't know. You know, that's that's a you know, that, that's a subjective. But in terms of the music, it's you know, it, it stands up to anything, in my opinion. And so, you know, to get rid of that stigma of, oh, that's just musical theater. Yeah. You know, I think that's a little close minded. And uh, I think that if people more people open their minds to that, then they're going to especially like through what you have in that book. You know, I think if people start diving into that, they're going to they're going to find some things in there that are going to really make them reconsider their opinions on on some of these shows and and the writers involved in it. Absolutely. I can tell you that it. um just this week, I started recording excerpts out of my book because I, a bunch of people were saying, hey, well, I got your book, but I, I want to hear the excerpts. And and sure, you can go to whatever streaming, you know, uh, avenues you want to, to, to hear the music, but it, it's not the extracted trumpet excerpt. So I, I thought I would put together a smattering of of those, and boy, it's been kicking my ass <laughs> to play West Side Story, you know, and and to try and get it perfect on a recording um, when you're just by yourself and not, you know, in, in amongst all the rest of the musicians and so on, um, and then put yourself under a microscope. Wow, that's uh, it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, that's what you do every day, you know, yeah. it, it, so. All right, well, you know, I want to. Uh, I have a couple couple of, of segments in the show that uh, these are kind of stand. This is the, the newest segment, and uh, I had to add this because the, sometimes I get the would get the criticism. Yeah, I really love the hang, love love hearing people talk, but you don't talk enough gear. So, <laughs> so we're going to talk gear a little bit. So this segment is called Gear Up, and um, but it's going to have the typical trumpet gurus slant on it so it's going to take a left turn halfway through this so uh what is your current gear setup well i'm with the uh, jupiter company so um shout out to them uh my my piccolo trumpet my flugelhorn um all the rest of it is is all jupiter i do have to admit and i have admitted to them um my main b flat that i play is an old colicchio 1s2 um I, I've been playing one since I was about 22 years old. And to me, that's the sound that I have in my head when I play commercial lead music. It's, I, I, I can get me out of that horn the easiest. Um, but the rest of the stuff, the, the flugel horn, the Jupiter, um, it's just, it's phenomenal. Um, it sounds so beautiful and intonation is great. All of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's that Calicchio. So, um, when this COVID is finally behind us, eventually, when it is, um, I'm, I'm hoping that that I'll be working with Jupiter on a, a new design of a horn. And they, they do have a lightweight, they call it a lightweight. It's still, for me, um, because I, 
I'm lazy and I don't want to have to work so hard to light up a horn, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit heavy and where the bracing is and so on. Um, funny thing is, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but playing Aladdin in LA, Wayne Bergeron and I were, were at, and Rob Scher, we were the three trumpet players. And, uh, I was hired as a local second player because I would have been laid off otherwise. So mm -hmm. Wayne was playing lead and I was there to play second and then sub for Wayne when he subbed out uh, whatever percentage, I think they're allowed 30 or 35%. Um, so one night I picked up this, this lightweight Jupiter and I was playing and Wayne was next to me and he leans over at some point and he says, are you playing your, your lead part? Just, you know, by memory, you know, because I'd been playing a couple months prior to being in LA. And I said, No, I'm just I'm playing the same, my second part, the same thing I've been playing. And he goes, Man, I, I can't hear a note you're playing. And yet I was hearing so much coming back at me. I picked up my Colicchio and he's, Oh, okay, all right. Uh, I hear you. You're you're here. So um anyway, I I gotta work with them a little bit on yeah. that to to really light it up. Yeah. So th that's that's my trumpet gear my uh my mouthpieces i i have a line with uh picket brass mm -hmm. and um i mean for the real geeks of of us <laughs> out there size wise um it would be about a bach five in diameter and maybe about a bach d in in depth so not terribly narrow and not terribly shallow mm -hmm. um it's a pretty free-blowing um backboard as well peter and i worked um we, we, I think I had five or six different prototypes getting larger backboards each time. And I think I picked number five mm -hmm. um, as, as it was progressively getting larger and larger. So I, I like to get some air out through the horn, but I also like to have um, that, that sort of D cup to, to push against and have some resistance. Yeah. All right. And well, and, and that's an interesting thing. Cause that, uh, you know, when I talk to people about gear, uh, you know, the, the average person they talk about gear, it's going to be, you know, what mouthpiece you play, what trumpet you play. And that's, that's pretty much it. You know, what, what mouthpiece is the best one to play double high C on? You know, that, those are the questions you get, but I think it's more important to, to understand not just what you play, but why you play it. So what you're saying about the bracing, um, is very interesting because, you know, most people don't understand how doing, you know, just very little things like uh, changing the placement of the brace or removing a brace completely uh, or going from uh, a S brace or Z or however you want to call it to like a straight sure. brace, um, free floating braces, things like that. All of those things affect the horn and you know, how it plays and the feedback that you get. So, uh, you know, some people do like to have, and I hate to use the word uh, dead, but kind of like a, a, a more of a heavier kind of just like block that you're, you know, that you're playing on. And some sure. people like to have a lot of feedback. They, they want to, they actually want to, I know people that want to feel the horn vibrate when it plays. Right. Uh, so uh, where, where do you fall in that camp? Are you more of like, you know, you want that, that lighter, zingier feeling in the horn where, where, uh, whereas, you know, it, as opposed to like the, the darker, heavier, I don't say the sound is darker, but just, you know, the kind of heavier, heavier sure. horn. Uh, I, I definitely lend or lean towards the, the lighter, more efficient, um, equipment, which is not to say that I don't play heavier things. If I have to play a, a strictly classical, um, you know, show, or if I'm playing extra in a symphony or, or the ballet or opera, um, I would want to play, you know, m more heavier and maybe more compact kind of, uh, equipment, but by and large, I'm, I'm sort of known as a commercial lead player and that's mostly the work that I do. So I want to make the job as easy as possible. If I can get a trumpet that can play itself and all I'm doing is just <laughs> miming, um, you know, and, and I can keep that secret between you and I, that's great. But shy of, of the horn playing itself, I want it to almost be able to play itself. So I don't want to have to work so hard to get, um, a, a real zing to my sound, which is not to say um, that we can't all get a zing on a heavier horn, but it's how much effort it takes to, to get what I'm hearing in my head. And for me, I feel most comfortable on, on a lighter setup. 
Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but, and that's, but not terribly light. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying about you know the sound that you hear, you know, and, and this is again one of those those themes that that recurs is that it's all about finding the right tool for the job. And you know, if if there's only w- if there was one horn, whether it was you know the, the Jupiter or you know the Calicchio or a Bach Mount Vernon, whatever it is, you know, if there was one horn that was the best horn, then everyone would play that horn. Sure. You know, you've got to find the right tools for the job. And I, I know that like for myself, that was kind of the, you know, when I was in, in, uh, in college, that was the thing. It's like, okay, you know, if you're going to be a trumpet major, you need to be playing a Bach 37 and a one and a half C. Yep. And it, it didn't matter what you were doing. That's what you, you, you needed to play. And it's like, eh, okay, well maybe it works for you, but I could never play a Bach. You know, even to this day, I've only played one Bach horn. And I was like, yeah, you know, actually, I, I, I could see having this in my stable of horns. None of the other ones, you know, they just don't fit the way that I approach the instrument. So um, with and, and talking about like the mouthpiece and stuff like that, um, do you like your resistance up front or do you like it more towards the back end of the horn? Great question. And, and, uh, yeah, a lot of people have varying places that they, they like that resistance for me. I, I want to feel it right up front. Um, that cup, as I said earlier, I like to, to have, a, for me, I need to have like a bowl shape. I, I could never respond very well to, uh, a V shaped cup or, or a modified, you know, CV or VC, whatever uh, shape. I, I like to have a pretty good contour and something to push up against. So I feel that resistance because for me, I play with a really open, loose aperture, mm-hmm. um, low C, double C. It's the same size, basically. It's just how fast the air is going. So I like that resistance up front. Then I like it to open up into a pretty good sized backbore. Um, the Colicchio uh, number two, is it? No. Yeah. The, the two is the, the pipe. Um, it, it's got a pretty tight venturi to start with, and then it opens pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and the bell choke is, uh, is along the lines of about a 72 Bach, uh, for those out there that are, you know, Bach people and so on. So for me, it's, it's tight up here. Uh, and then it progressively or per, yeah, progressively opens up uh, more. And th- that's, that's it. So we were talking way early about, uh, you know, the twenties, thirties, our forties and so on, and being more efficient and, and resilient and so on. That was one of the things that I had to, to reassess was the equipment as well. Um, and, and I more matched it to my body where I like to feel the resistance. And I think that the match of the mouthpiece and the horn with my oral cavity and how I play, um, I, I kind of gravitated back towards that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I know that in, uh, your trumpet, uh, voluntarily book, you do talk about this, um, this is the last part of the gear thing. So, uh, when people come to you and uh, want to know what kind of gear, they should be looking at what are the the criteria that you usually give to people? Like these are the things that you should consider when you try, when you're looking for a new mouthpiece, or these are the things you want to consider when you're looking for a new horn. What's, what's your advice to the person who's looking to upgrade their gear? Sure. Well, the first thing I would ask them is uh, what type of music do you see yourself playing or what do you mostly play? You know, um, we could pick any percentage, but let's say 75% of the time, what kind of stuff do you play? Okay, well, let's let's talk about the gear that would best be suited for that. Um, you know, if you're going to be playing um, third trumpet in an orchestra, you're probably not going to play a 1S2 Colicchio and, you know, a, a jet tone or something, um, you know, because it's not going to be the right tool for the job. That's not to say that there's not somebody out there that could make that sound beautiful and correct in that setting. Um, But by and large, most of us couldn't do that. Um, The same thing is if you're going to be playing, uh, 
you know, in Earth, Wind, and Fire, you're probably not going to want to show up with a one and a quarter Bach mouthpiece and a 37 heavyweight Bach trumpet uh, and try and get through that gig. I don't know what Bobby Burns plays on, but um, and boy, if he plays on on the equipment I just described, um, then uh, He's forget even what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. Um, oh, yeah. You know, but but by and large, there are certain conventions that, you know, most people fit within. So I, I would just, you know, ask them about this style of music. And and um, and then it all it also comes down to shoe size. You know, um, somebody I've mentioned Byron Stripling can play a one and a half C and play lead. Um, he's got much more fleshy chops than than I do. I've got fleshier chops than other people that might be able to fit into um, something really shallow and and I, I can't make a sound out of it. So, you know, there would be that, finding your shoe size, finding um, the mouthpiece that you can consistently get a vibration from the bottom of your range to the top of your range without any um, dropouts or without having to shift you know, from top to bottom and move the mouthpiece around. You want it to be able to flow all the way through your range. So I, I would say um, get something that would allow you to be able to do that, that doesn't impede your vibration. Once you get the shoe size, I think then it's a matter of tailoring it to the sound that you want to get. Um, you know, uh, a five rim doesn't mean you're going to get a certain sound. It just means that it feels a certain way on your chops. Then you can deal with the the shallow or deep um, cup. You can deal with the back bore and the throat size. There's so many other things. Um, and as far as the, the trumpet, I would say, you know, uh, figure out what kind of sound you want to have and and just try so many different trumpets and don't be concerned about whatever that manufacturer stamped on the bill. It doesn't matter if it's a Blessing or a Monet or a Bach or a Colicchio or anything else. If it feels right to you, that's the right horn for you. So um, I hate the, to get vibed when I'm in a section or, uh, or you know, show up and, and somebody looks down there, oh, you're playing a Colicchio, huh? You know, like that's not going to be able to blend. Um, I, I do some some work uh, in the Seattle area doing recordings for, I don't know, uh, video games. I don't even know most of these things. World of Warcraft and some things like that. And and I I, I get the, uh, the blessing to sit next to Alan Vizzuti from time to time. Mm -hmm. And... Alan is so cool. I mean, he'll look at that and he'll, he'll, you know, Oh, Colicchio, huh? And then we play and then everything's cool, yeah. you know? So you, you can, you can blend and, and play in tune and play the right style and it, on so many different things. So it, it's a matter of finding what's right for you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That right. didn't definitively answer that question. Cause I don't think you can. No, no, it, you can't. And, and that's, I think that's why it's so important to ask the question because uh, I look at things as like, you know, every bit of information you get is kind of like, you know, the pixels in a, in a picture uh, you, know, you, you want to get as many as possible and then, you know, stitch them together and that's going to give you more detail on how to do it. And, you know, as opposed to, Hey, well, if you're a commercial player, you should be playing a a Colicchio. If you're if you're a legit player, you should be playing a Bach. Well, maybe, maybe not. Just depends. And you know, all of these things and and the way that that professionals think about the process that it's not simply you're not buying a horn like most most people. Uh, you're not buying a horn because some other guy plays that horn. You're buying the horn because you're looking for the most effic uh, of efficient tool for the job. And, uh, you know, so using that knowledge to help people uh, understand that, hey, absolutely, you would love to have people, uh, you know, the whole world playing on those uh, Paul Barron uh, picket mouthpieces. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they're not going to fit everybody. And, exactly. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I, I like I like to ask that question because I think it is just a, a missing component in the real world education of trumpet players. So just the last little quick point before you move on from there is that I, I think that we should all stay true to the sound that we have in here and in here. Um, and, and 
that will help guide your journey on on deciding what mouthpieces and and horns to play and and mutes for that matter too you know um get a certain sound concept and 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 just try everything you can mouthpieces and horns and so on um to to most easily get that sound out of your body yeah cool all right well we're going to get to the final portion of our show and this is the world famous robinson's remedies rapid fire round brought to us by our very good friends kenny and richard at robinson's remedies where you can show your chops lots of love so uh this is a series of questions that are going to go all over the place and uh i just want your quickest answer don't think about it too hard just let it fly so are you ready i'm ready all right here is your first question who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player Gandhi. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite book? A Soprano on Her Head. What's the worst movie you've ever seen? What was that one with Kevin Costner where the whole uh, thing world? sinks? Yes. <laughs> you and about 30 million other people. Uh, yeah. If you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? I thought about being a chiropractor and a veterinarian. You could be a chiropractic veterinarian. There you go. And two birds, one stone. That plays trumpet. What's your favorite drink? Uh, beer, wine, vodka. Uh, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Liquid. Uh, all right. Uh, you could throw a dinner party. And invite any three living people in the world, any three living people to this dinner party. Who would you invite? Oh, I would start with uh, Barack Obama. That would be really cool. Um, God, I'm not sure who else I'd want to have. Um, Wayne Bergeron is always fun to hang with. Uh, I'm not sure who the third person would be. My, my wife, so that she can uh, keep me from saying really dumb things. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you had an extra chair, I'd show up for that one. Oh, I did, you're more than welcome. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Uh, same dinner party. You got, you, you've got three extra chairs. Uh, invite any three people. The only caveat is they must be someone from history, so someone who is no longer with us. I would love to sit down with Conrad Gazzo sometime. Mm. Um one of my biggest influences and also Al Hurt. Um, I, I know I'm naming two trumpet players, um, but that would be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I got and one I, more. Third one. Uh, I, geez. I don't know. Let's say Gandhi again. That'd be <laughs> amazing to just sit down and, and trying to absorb more a high Uyeshiba. Ah, uh, uh, there you go. Okay. All right. Lacquer plated or raw? Uh, I always gravitate to silver plate. Okay. For no other reason other than, you know, it, I don't know. It shines. Yeah. There you go. Shiny objects. What's your favorite quote? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, that's there's one. Quote. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's a good one. Um, if I could swear just one word. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, when I was about 12 years old, I had a trumpet teacher um, about the only good trumpet teacher I had. And he used to say, fuck them if they can't take a joke. Ah, uh, that's, that's, that's part of my motto in life. Yeah, and you know what? That's gotten me through so many stressful situations where I just think, okay, I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. All right. What is your greatest fear? My greatest fear is showing up totally ill-prepared, uh, for a gig. And have done that and uh, paid the price <laughs> terribly just by, you know, sheer nerves and so on. I thought you were going to say showing up totally naked for a gig. <laughs> and you've probably done that too, but that's <laughs> completely, it was the 80s. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And it was just that one time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah come on. Uh, all right. Um, you could be granted any one superpower. What would it be? 
Wow, these are really tough questions. One superpower. Um, uh, absolute wisdom. Is that a superpower? Yeah, I would consider that a superpower. Sure. All right, absolute wisdom. That's a good one. Um, what aspect of trumpet playing do you find to be the most overrated? High notes. Hmm. Okay. And what aspect of trumpet playing do you find to be the most underrated? Getting a beautiful sound and forsaking that beautiful sound for high notes. Yep. So you want to have beautiful sounding high notes is there you the go. lesson of the story. There. Sound beautiful always. Yes, there you go. Um, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Listen a lot more and, and don't be afraid to try things. Okay. And while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Hmm. Don't sweat the small things. And fuck them if they can't take a joke. <laughs> there you go. All right. And the final question. What do you want your legacy to be? I would love it if people, when I'm not on this earth anymore, to say, you know what? He was really great to have on a gig. Um, always a positive uh, outlook and attitude. And... Um, and just helped elevate it, you know, to a, I, I should have thought about this a little bit longer, but just, you know, to, to, to leave with a positive footprint rather than, oh boy, I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, uh, I, I think that when it's all said and done, I think that's all that any of us really want is just, you know, to make the world a, you know, leave the world a better place than it was uh before we got here. So that's a much better way to say it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You know, and, and you're doing, you're doing your part, uh, in with your music, your writing. And, uh, so I just thank you very much for, for spending time with us today and for your inspiration and, uh, make sure if, uh, you know, any of, any of you want to learn more about what's going on, you can check out the links in the show notes and, uh, you know, definitely check out Paul's webpage and uh, check out those books because there, there's some really good stuff in there that uh, especially if you're looking to uh, delve into that world of Broadway music, this is a great place to, to start. It's actually the first place. It's the only place to start right now other than just, <laughs> just getting the gig. So um, I, you know, I can't recommend uh, Paul highly enough. So, Thank you very much, my friend, and looking forward to the day that we can uh, have a deeper conversation about uh, martial arts and music and and uh, do that over a liquid beverage or 20. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I would really look forward to that. Yeah. And uh, so for all of you who joined us, thank you very much for your time and uh, keep practicing. And as always, peace and slide grease. We are out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound, and I'll see you at the next hang.